right. Good morning, everybody. Those that are outside, come on in. And uh, get you to kill that music there. Great. Okay. Special morning this morning. Um, uh, by way of announcement, uh, just so that you know if you start to smell some, I don't think she's cooking, but it's going to be soup and sandwich kind of thing. Uh, there is lunch provided after the service. We have our congregational meeting today. But everyone's invited if you want to stay for lunch. Even if you're not staying for the congregational meeting, please join us afterwards uh, as lunch. And uh, we'll have a great time together. Um, now, we have a special uh, couple of guests with us here this morning. Um, we've got Alana James on the piano, and Daisy Jang is uh, going to be leading us in singing here this morning, along with our team. And uh, I'll introduce them or call them up in a couple of minutes. But before we do that, um, we have been memorizing this key passage of Scripture that our uh, vision statement is based on. So, if you have one of these sheets, the green ones, and I, by this point, like we're giving these away every Sunday. At this point, some of you should have multiple copies of these plastered all over the place. Um, so we're going to um, get you to stand up, and we're going to read the first three verses. Um, actually, we're going to read, yeah, we'll read the first three verses, but we're, we're going to memorize the first two and a half verses. So if you have it... Um, this is what it says. Let's read it together. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, and we'll just stop there. We pray. I pray that out of his glorious riches. I pray that out of, so I pray, so do this. I pray that out of his glorious riches. I pray that out of his glorious riches. Now we're going to backtrack a little bit. And this uh, first one you may or may not be able to do. Uh, but I, for this reason, I kneel before, and I talked about your before knees. And so you have to go before. For this reason, I kneel before the, stand up. <laughs> the Father. Let's try that again for those that are, can still kneel. For this reason, I kneel before. From whom, and you can do some actions here, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches. Okay, let's do all of that together. For this reason I kneel before my Father in heaven, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches. Okay, good. You got two and a half verses. We only got like eight more to go. So like, all right, great. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, welcome you here this morning. It's great to be together. Thank you for our special guests and everyone who calls this their church home. Uh, we pray that this would be a rich time of worshiping you together. And uh, <coughs> Father, lift our hearts. Wherever people are coming from, whatever life's got for them right now, I pray that they would um, just find us a safe place to come to seek you, to bring the burdens of their hearts before you, and that you would lift us up. Uh, we come to worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I'm going to get the team up here. I've introduced them. You'll want to stay standing, I think. If you can't stand, if you've already wore out your knees, feel free to sit. But um, this is Daisy Jang, and uh, she's a student at Vanguard College, and she is from Uganda. I'll uh, get her to tell some more of her story. I'll introduce her a little bit later on in the service. But uh, she's studying music, and she can sing. And a uh, special guest, uh, Alana James and her husband Dave. Uh, Alana's on piano uh, from Sturgeon Valley Baptist Church. We met yesterday at Sturgeon Valley to uh, rehearse, and because uh, it's closer for some of us. And uh, so all these guys were there singing away. So we're ready to sing. Are you? Yes? Oh, okay, good. Let's go. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, no, it's such an honor to be here. Um, and yeah, something that I love about worship um, and uh, singing, it's, it, it goes beyond just the words. 
that we sing. It's, it's a great opportunity to come together before our Heavenly Father. And so it's such a privilege to be here this morning. So yeah, let's, let's worship Amen. him. same God who never fails, will not fail me now, will not fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out, working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you high. to be grateful um, because God is so good. And uh, the next song that we're singing says, he is our living hope. And we know that the hope in Christ will never disappoint. Um, having grown up in a life that constantly I needed hope, this song really speaks to me a lot. And I don't know, my situation could have been different from yours. I just pray that as we sing it, we can focus on Jesus and know that he is constantly our living hope.
us into the presence of God. One thing I like about heaven is that there's going to be a choir of millions and billions of people who, who have been rescued and brought into the presence of holiness and perfection because of the blood of Christ, and we're going to acknowledge that, and we're going to recognize that. There's not going to be any debate. There's not going to be any worries about whether we're offending someone. We're just going to lay our crowns down, and we're going to worship. And that's going to be one of those things that we can do in its eternity. So we don't. our voices won't get tired. Our knees won't get sore. And all of you who wish that you could sing, I'm going to be listening to you guys sing. I've sung a lot, and I love to sing, and I love to worship. So I love God's people worshiping most of all. And I, I believe God's going to give you all voices that just will make, you know, will tears come to my eyes. I'm uh, here to lead you in, in prayer. We've been praying all morning already. But I just want to uh, recognize that we still live in this fallen world. Um, I have a couple of funerals to go to in the next couple of weeks. Uh, family has passed on. That was uh, one of them was expected. The other one, we thought she was rounding the corner and getting better, and suddenly she's gone. It happens. This is not heaven yet. But we get a, a glimpse of it. We get a taste of it. And we get to love each other in a community and take care of each other. And that takes work and effort. And one of the things that we're going to do is take up an offering after I'm done praying. So you can start writing out your checks now. Add a zero. <laughs> we're coming to the end. We're going to talk about the budget downstairs after the church. Uh, service is over too. Um, and we're going to talk about faith and we're going to talk about uh, trusting in God. But let's, um, let's just come before uh, our Father in heaven together. God, our Father in heaven, we acknowledge that you are holy. You are perfect. You are just and loving. And you created us. Your imagination, your creativity built us this universe just by you speaking it into existence. And you wanted to have fellowship with more than just the Trinity. Even though you didn't need us, you thought this is an opportunity for you to express your love and for you to experience love from us. And so we want to make you happy this morning. We want to make you happy in our time here on earth. We are looking forward to spending eternity with you. Whatever assignment you have for us in, in eternity, whatever our role is, one of the things that we are going to do is worship you because we're going to see not through a glass darkly. We're going to see you face to face and we're going to recognize the, the true vast depth and width and height of your love for us. Amen. That you rescued us, that you saved us, that Jesus you came and died for us while we were in rebellion against you. You sacrificed yourself, not for your friends, but for your enemies. And so you've made us into your friends. We are, um, we are so blessed here. 
We want to acknowledge that you have blessed us and given us many material gifts. We are going to bring those gifts before you in a moment. And we ask that you would bless the gifts and, and bless those who are giving generously and, and happily. Um, because it, the Bible says you love a cheerful giver. And we want to be cheerful in, in giving back to you a portion of what you've given to us. And we want to know that the rest of it we hold as stewards because it's yours. We want to use all of our resources which are your resources for your will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So we pray that you would bless the, the gifts that you give and the givers that um, we would be, we would have the resources, have the ability to do the tasks that you have assigned to us. And we know that you have given us many gifts and opportunities to celebrate. And we're thankful for that, that we can have times of festivals and times of celebration that you put into the calendar even for your people in the Old Testament. And uh, we know that one of the first things that's going to happen when we all get together in heaven is going to be a, a wedding supper of the Lamb and it's going to be a banquet. We look forward because we know that you are rich you have everything that we need and you made the universe and you are generous. We have a lot of um, concerns because Lord, it's not we're not in heaven yet. We pray for health. There are many that are struggling. Our bodies are not meant to live forever. These mortal bodies break down. They have a limited lifespan. And we are looking forward to getting the bodies that you plan for us to have that are eternal. But in the meantime, Lord, help us to have grace as we deal with our health and with the health of those around us. Help us to have love and compassion. And I pray that you would direct the resources and the people to be in the right place because we don't want people to be lonely or afraid. We pray for our government at all governments at all levels and we pray that your will would be done we pray that um, we pray for our country that uh, we would work together and um, that there would be uh, understanding of people who disagree with us especially within the church that we would be united in trusting in you and not trusting in um, the government because uh, our king is in, is in heaven. Our king is sitting at the right hand of the, of the father. He earned the right to be our king by overcoming death and sin and the, and the grave and that's who we follow forever. We, uh, we thank you for the, the uh, partnerships that we have with your people all around the world. There's missionaries. There's uh, mission churches. There's small churches meeting today in uh, every country of the world. And we're grateful that um, your light is going forth and shining pray that you would bless your church and lead us into obedience and blessing. And uh, we thank you for the, our local partners and, and the, the NAB. And I don't have that piece of paper. It tells me who to pray for today. So Lord, we're going to just pray for the NAB today and the ABA, the Alberta Baptist Association, just the small group of churches who name you as Lord. And um, we're not, we don't have anything special. There's nothing unique about us. We want to be faithful just like so many other churches want to be faithful. Um, and we don't want to build our own kingdom or empire. Uh, we want to just obey you and be 
your witness in the place that you've put us. And for us, that's on a way. Um, Lord, there are people all around us that don't have that living hope. That they don't they don't believe that anyone has ever risen from the dead. They don't believe that there's anything beyond this life. Some of those people are in our families, Lord. Some of those people are our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers. And in the midst of all of the messages that are, are being sent, people are watching videos on the internet, they're listening to podcasts, they're watching TV and the news and listening to radio, and out of all of that, Lord, not much of it is presenting the gospel in a way that they can hear. Thank you that we can be their friend and help us to love them. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak in our hearts to know when to speak to those people. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the encouragement it is to be together today. Thank you again for the offering that's about to be collected. And I pray that it would be used uh, not only just to keep the lights on here in this building, but strategically to uh, send a message to our community that we do have hope, there is hope, and there is love, and there is generosity, and there is grace um, that comes from you through us. All of this I pray in Jesus' name. First, you come and collect the offering. Miranda, thank you. And then we're going to sing the doxology when it's collected. So this is at this point, the kids who aren't singing can go downstairs for Sunday school if you want. It's derived from the book of Revelation, chapter 4. And the picture that is painted here is um, a God on the throne, 24 elders surrounding him, uh, the cherubim and seraphim, just singing one word, holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. Um, and just, it, you know, the writer attempts to describe the verses, the majesty of our God. And yet, this same God who is so versed and mighty calls us, his own, his children, um, and it, it's just such a beautiful thing. So as we worship, let's just meditate on that. Sing a new song to him who 
we thank you for your majesty. We thank you for your holiness. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the privilege to be called your own. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You're here.
job on the drums, Crystal. We had a great time yesterday um, in a bigger church uh, with some more equipment and stuff, and they got a chance to see what um, a little bit bigger of a church was like. Uh, but if you talk to people at Sturgeon Valley and you call them a big church, they'd be like, what? <laughs> um, just like if, if you say um, this is, or some people would call this a big church, and you'd be like, what? <laughs> anyway. Today, I want to talk about one of our value statements, our DNA, and this is the one on authenticity is our style. And it's kind of ironic, and I didn't plan it this way, but it's landing on this today. And uh, so I want to share it with you. I want to tell you a story first. I, um, as you know, was recently on vacation and down in Mexico with the family. And uh, we went to this place that uh, about 15 years ago online, I don't remember where we found it. We, there, there wasn't Airbnb back then, but there was this little house. Uh, I mean, it's not little, but it's not a real fancy house, and, um, but it's in a nice area. And so we went there with the kids, and it was one of our favorite vacations. It was just great. It has this, I mean, it's all yellow and bright colors and, and has this little homemade pool out front with some rocks and stuff. It, it was just a lot of fun. We have great memories with and then uh, not long ago, uh, we were looking on Airbnb, and we saw the same place. Like, great, and asked the kids, would you like to go? And of course, they were like, yes. So, so we went to this place, and we had a, a great time. Um, now, side story is about 15, well, about 20 years ago, I was meeting with a, a man, Mr. Seeley, who was my mentor, and um, uh, he memorized scripture, and he challenged me to memorize scripture. And so I... Uh, I started to memorize scripture, and I, I, I bought a Bible to memorize it out of a New Testament with Psalms and Proverbs in it, and, and I, I decided I'd get two Bibles at the same time, so if one wore out or something like that, then I, I'd have the second Bible there. And so I took the second Bible, put it on the shelf in the box and everything. About 15 years ago, I had to get that um, second Bible off the shelf, um, 13 years or whatever, whenever. Uh, and uh, I, I never did find out what happened to that first Bible that I'd started to memorize out of. And then we went on this vacation. And about a couple hours after we were there, my wife comes out and she says, Brian, is this your Bible? <laughs> I'm like, no way. And I looked through it and sure enough, this was my Bible that I had lost 15 years ago in the house in Mexico, so now I have both Bibles back, and I'm like, wow, is that ever incredible? Just the, what are the chances that that Bible was still there? And it was a couple of days later, I got pickpocketed and lost money, but it was worth it because I got the Bible back. But, I, but as I'm looking at it, I'm like, is this the real Bible? My wife's looking for it. She's looking for some markings. And because it was the Bible I memorized out of, I only had a couple of things in the um, that I had underlined, and one of them was in First Peter, and I, I, I looked in that, and sure enough, there was my markings. It is my actual Bible. It's the real deal. It's the authentic thing. Now, he's saying authenticity is our style here at this church, or this is what we aspire to be. Um, what does the word authentic mean? Well, down in Mexico, if you have authentic Mexican food, it means it's really spicy. I actually kind of prefer a mix of Tex-Mex, um, some American sort of flavor to it. Some of the Mexican food is a little bit too spicy, but authentic means that it's the real deal. The word authentic <coughs> means being true to yourself. The first part of the word means self, A-U-T. Um, it's from a Latin origin, but the first part of it, ought, means self. And the second part of it, tenes, or T-H-E-N-E-S, is means self or yourself. So it means true to yourself. Being authentic means true to that which is original, true to yourself. This was my authentic Bible. It was really the one that I had from before. It, it meant a lot to me. I was, I was delighted, blown away, actually, that it was still it was there. But when we talk about here in this church being authentic, or authenticity is our style. What, is we, what do we mean by that? 
four things I think we mean by it, and I'm going to give them to you very quickly. Um, first thing is simplicity. The first thing of authenticity is simplicity. And if you have your notes, you can follow along in that. But to do this, I want to take you to Luke. I got too many Bibles here now. I'm going to take you to Luke chapter 10. If you've got the, your Bible handy, um, turn there, Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to the end of the chapter, just a few verses. And this story, maybe you know, Jesus and his disciples were on their way. He came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to them. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work all by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Or, in your translations, you may find a note at the bottom that says only a few things are needed. Only one thing is needed. Only a few things are needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away. Simplicity. Simplicity. We value keeping life and ministry as simple as possible. Or maybe we should say as simple as is reasonable. See, in this story, as, as they're getting, um, they're meeting together, and they're, they're um, having a meal of some sort, um, Martha is busy with all of the details and planning this meal, and, and, and she comes to Jesus and says, you know, why are you... Tell Martha or tell Mary to come and help me. He says, No, you're you're busy on too many things. When I was in Bible college, my one of my professors taught through this and and, and he pointed out this part here that in your translations may say only a few things are needed. And I think that probably makes the best sense of this passage because they obviously had to eat. If if he's trying to say here, you don't need to worry about eating, you don't need to worry about fixing a meal, it doesn't really make sense with what's going on. And perhaps that's the reason why there's some confusion over exactly how it should be translated. But only a few things are needed. He's saying, I think, basically to Martha, Martha, soup and sandwich is fine. Why are you going to all this extra effort? You're choosing to spend all this time and extra effort. You're placing the priority in the wrong places. Simple. We value keeping life and ministry as simple as reasonable, as simple as possible. Now, when I say that, I don't mean sloppy. Simple, not sloppy. Simple, not stupid. We use that term sometimes as he's simple, she's simple. You shouldn't say that, but sometimes we mean that as stupid. No, we don't mean that. So we don't mean we dumb down ministry. We don't dumb down what we're doing here. Simple, not spur of the moment. We don't mean that. Not flying by the seat of your pants. Simple. You see, you can have simple and skilled at the same time. But you need to be careful. Uh, there's been such an emphasis on excellence in ministry over the years that I would dare say that excellence can become the enemy of authenticity. They were so pursuing all of the trimmings and all of the extra things that we lose sight over what's most important. Simplicity. Simplicity. Now, after we meet together this morning, there's meal prepared, and Pat is always busy working at things. But it's soup and sandwiches, folks. <laughs> We're not spreading a big meal. I think it's soup and sandwiches, something like that. It's simple. But here's the other thing about simplicity, is that simplicity needs to match the situation. There's some times when you need to put on a fancy meal. If you had soup and sandwiches at a big wedding or a big banquet, it wouldn't match the situation. Simplicity needs to match the situation that it's in. We value simplicity in ministry here. We value having, and it's, it's pretty neat actually, Daisy um, asked her some time ago if she'd come and I was hoping to have a gang from Vanguard here and, and it's reading week and so the Vanguard people couldn't join her and so I asked, well, could some of our people sing along with you? And I'm actually glad for that. Because it, it has, uh, uh, it fits with the simplicity and genuineness of what we're trying to do here. 
authenticity. Because some of you are, you know, impressed with Daisy and Zig. But the others of you are like, those are our kids up there. Those are our people. That's Kristen. Listen to her on the drums. There's something about working together with our people. We value that simplicity. It needs to match the situation, though. If this church grows and becomes larger, then there's more expectation. Um, right now, um, there's, you're quite welcome to get involved and, and do some of these things, but if you're in a larger church, you've got you to uh, increase your skill level. This is not foreign to Scripture. In Numbers chapter 36, they're building uh, the tabernacle, and uh, a couple of um, people are called there, and every skilled person to whom the Lord has given skill and ability to know how to carry out all the work of constructing the sanctuary are to do the work just as the Lord has commanded. Then Moses summoned Bezalel and Eliabib and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability. It wasn't just whoever has a heart to do it does it. There was skill required building the tabernacle. Uh, if you're going to get involved in various areas of ministry, we want you to be skilled at what you're doing. We want you to develop your ability. If you're in some of these larger churches, I mean, Sturgeon Valley, they meet regularly to practice and work on that, on stuff. Um, and yet, if you talk to some of the worship members at Sturgeon Valley, they look at like a Beulah Alliance church and something like that. And it's like, that's a whole other level. Many of them would never be able to be at Beulah Alliance church on the worship team because they just don't have the skill or they don't have the time to develop the skill. It's not a matter of the heart in that sense. It's a matter of matching the skill to the situation. Sing to him a new song, Psalm 33, where he says, play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. They were all under the direction of their father, this is in First Chronicles, in the music of the house of the Lord, with cymbals and harps and lyres for the service of the house of God. Asaph and Jedithun and Heman were under the order of the king, the number of them along with their brothers who were trained in singing to the Lord, all who were skillful, there were 288 of them, skilled. But when I'm talking about authenticity, the emphasis is on simplicity. Yes, we need to develop skill. Pat has developed a lot of skill in cooking a nice lunch. But it's going to be simple. It's going to match the situation. Secondly, organic. We value most growth that comes naturally and from within. So simple and then organic. We value most growth that comes naturally and from within. Organic in the sense of... Um, the definition of organic I'm using is having the characteristics of an organism. I love dictionary definitions. Just use the word to define itself. But it's, it's part of an organism. When we're talking about growth in this church, we're talking about it's part of an organism. So in Mary and Martha here in this story, you notice that they didn't just order skip the dishes. If it was there. But we could import people to do all the ministry here. We could. It might cost a lot. You know, how are we going to get them to come here? And it's not that we won't bring people in like this morning and, and help us out and inspire us and, 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 you know, try some different things. But Mary and Martha um, were responsible for making the meal. The ministries of this church are your responsibility, my responsibility. We need to have you involved in ministry. We want it to be organic. You know, Jesus could have did the feeding of the 5,000 miraculously with every meal, but he chose not to. He wanted Mary and Martha to cook the meal. Keep it simple. Organic. We value growth. We value meeting people where they are in life and seeing them grow. Seeing them grow. I don't know where you're at. Maybe you feel like you'd like to try some different ministries. Um, maybe you feel like you'd like to try youth ministry. You'd like to help out in children's ministry. And by the way, we need help in these areas. But we want you to come from where you're at and we want you to grow. Increase in skill. Increase in knowledge. 
You know, right after this passage of Mary and Martha, the next um, chapter is a chapter where it's the Lord's Prayer. And, and it's interesting because we just basically use Jesus' prayer a lot of times, but it's interesting that they said to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Life is about growing and becoming more like Jesus, and it's about progressing along the way. It's interesting when I got a little granddaughter, every time I see her, it seems like she's grown. You know, you get these little kids, and when they're, when they're you know, like eight years old, let's say, and you're like, man, have you ever grown? You try saying that to a 30-year-old woman. You get in a lot of trouble. It seems that as, uh, as we get older, we don't value growth as much. Well, maybe for other reasons. But, but I would hope that in the Christian life that we would continue to grow, that you are not the same person today with the same level of knowledge that you were 20 years ago. ago. Sometimes when we're young in the Christian walk, we grow incredibly, and then we just kind of plateau. What are you doing in your Christian walk to continue to grow? We want to help you in doing that. Authenticity, simple, organic needs to involve growth. And the last one is replication. We value multiplying leaders and serving those who serve according, uh, or helping those who serve according to God's call in their lives. Those around us that we are working with are not in the same place that we are in terms of our spiritual there's people that are new to their faith, or maybe there's people that just need some, some encouragement along the way. And we as a church, when we talk about authenticity in ministry, it means having to look around us and saying, who can we help grow in their spiritual walk? Which means this for leaders, by the way. Who are you helping to grow in, your spiritual, in their spiritual walk? If you're leading in some area, is there someone that you are, who is following? Who are you you're training up? Who are you helping along? I love how Howard Hendricks says it. He says that if you think you're a leader, take a look back over your shoulder. If no one's there, you're just going for a walk. <laughs> Who's following behind you? Who's watching your life? Who are you helping? Who are you building into? And so as a church, because we want to be authentic, it means growing. And this really, this whole bit is the crux of what we mean when we talk about discipleship. It means we're following after Jesus. We are looking for people that are in our lives, that are around us, that we're trying to lead and help them to use their spiritual gifts. We say that who serve according to God's call on their life. In 1 Peter chapter 1, this is right before... Um, the part of the passage that uh, I underlined in my Bible says, um, therefore prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Christ Jesus is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you, he called you, is holy, so be holy in all you do. And then in Second Peter, it talks about this holiness part, or this call as well again. It talks about, um, for this for every reason, make every effort to add to your faith. Remember the time when you came to Christ, but to add to your faith, goodness and knowledge and so on. And... Um, says in verse 10 of 2 Peter chapter 1, Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. That is, have you grown in your spiritual walk? Are you following after what God has called you to do? Here's maybe a newsflash for you. It's not just the pastor that is called by God. You are called by God. He said to you as children, come unto me. And you followed his voice. And he's got gifts and abilities that he's given to you. And he wants you to use those in serving him. Wherever you're at. 
And whatever God has brought into your life, would you use those things to serve him? As a church, we want to be authentic in our style. It's going to be simple. It's going to be down home. <laughs> it's going to be organic. It's going to involve growth. And it's going to involve replication. So I want to ask Daisy, if she'd come back up here. And uh, I'm going to grab that mic. Now, I, I, I have not known Daisy a long time. Well, five years or something like that. Um, but I, I know Daisy's story, and uh, I asked Daisy ahead of time if she would share a little bit of it with you. Daisy, tell us about your childhood, where you grew up, and what was it like? Mm. Wow, memory lane. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I come from um, East Africa, a country called Uganda, and uh, yeah, uh, my childhood, I would say, was um, a childhood full of luck and poverty. Um, very, very humble background, so yeah. Hmm. Um, this is a, quite a story. Like, you, your mom was thinking of not having you. Yes. What happened there? Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, so the story with that is I uh, um, come from a family of six children. And um, at that time, my mom, because I never met my biological dad, and shout out to my dad up there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, when my mom found out she was pregnant with me, um, not being able to know how she would feed another mouth, uh, she opted to have an abortion. Um, but just before she was going to have an abortion, she um, had an encounter, and this I always say was <coughs> the Lord stepping in. And uh, he uh, stepped in and um, spoke to her in a language that she understood. And she ended up not aborting me, and so here I am today. Yeah. <laughs> mm, very good. Now you um, you grew up basically in a public washroom. Yes. What is, tell us about that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it was um, I don't know how to explain <coughs> it, but uh, I grew up in a a slummy area, um, and uh, in that slum we had a public washroom that people would usually use. So, because my mom couldn't afford much, she decided to turn that into a shelter and a house that I, I grew up in. In fact, that's where I was born. You were born in the washroom? Yes, yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. um, when did you start singing? How did that come about? Singing, I started singing at the age of probably, probably for as long as I remember, maybe five years, five years old. And so I was actually, I grew up in a Baptist church like this, same size actually. And so, yeah, um, singing became a, a way of escape for me, um, a communication that I, a language that I spoke with God and it just really, really brought a lot of hope. So I started off singing in um, a choir, it was called Compassion. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of it. But it's, it's that, that's where I started, and that's how I, I met my family, uh, my Canadian family right here. And so, yeah, hi. So now, <coughs> being involved in the choir, you didn't just show up Sunday morning. No. What, so you had to put a fair bit of work into it. Yes. What yes. Tell us about that. So my mom used to, part of her ministry, um, to just give back to God, she used to clean and maintain the church. And so what would happen is, because I was the youngest, every time she would come to church, she would come with me, and there was this choir. So as my mom was cleaning, the choir was singing in the front. And so what I did with that is, I kind of learned all the songs that they were doing. <laughs> and so this one day, um, they were not being very good. And so what the, um, the choir master at that time did is, is like, telling them the opportunity that they had and the effort they needed to put in. So he decided to tell all of them to sit down and called me and a couple of people, a couple of kids who used to watch them, and we sang every word of the song better than <laughs> everyone else. <laughs> and so <laughs> that's how I got into uh, the choir, so yeah. And then in the choir, like you had to meet on Saturdays in practice? Yes, yes, we would meet every Saturday for practice. And it was also at that time where Compassion would actually um, have a session for kids. 
and they would uh, teach about Christ, teach about um, just life in general, and so would have a lot of that. And now you had to travel a fair ways to get to the church, to the practice, and yes. then for how far? Like, how did you get there? Oh, um, for the church, uh, the traveling was for school. But okay. For the church, it was um, it was quite a different a distance, maybe a twenty minute walk to the church. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. You didn't have snow to walk through on the way no, there. No. No. Good. All right. <laughs> All summer, all through the year, so that was quite nice. I don't think we would have survived. <laughs> Yeah, welcome to Canada. Um, now, God has used you, you know, from singing in the choir, um, and, and you don't talk a lot about this, so I'll brag a little yeah. bit on you, but um, you were part of, is it, Tusker, is it, was that the name of the Project Fame? Yes, yes. Tusker Project Fame sort of thing. It's kind of equivalent to American Idol in a couple of countries in Africa. Yeah. And how did you do in that? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> So yes, I went for a competition. I think Pastor Brian has said it's called Tasca Project Fame, an equivalent of um, American Idols here. And that is about five countries in East Africa. And uh, I happened to be, I came out as the second run up. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> now you were offered um, a deal or the, there were some recording yeah. groups that wanted you to, uh, so tell me about that, but also tell us why you turned it down. Hmm. So from a very young age, what uh, my mom did, God rest her soul, is uh, she really introduced me to God and always made sure, even at the time uh, before I really um, got God blessing me with family in my life, um, she always told me he is my father. And so I grew up with that. And as I grew up with that, I really just fell in love with him and he became my my refuge, my go-to place. And so that seed was sown so deep in me and I knew that the voice that it, I, I think I started noticing I had a, a different voice probably at the age of seven from other people. And then of course with the culture today, everyone, if you have a good voice, then definitely secular music, that's where the money is. But um, I just, I knew that one, because my mom was telling me that, but also just the relationship that I developed there. I knew that the gift he had given me was to serve him. And so getting these opportunities that were coming, um, I think the one you're talking about was um, uh, Sony, because part of the reason they were sponsoring the project fame that I was at. And so Sony is a very big company. And so they did approach me and wanted to take me in as an artist. But what they wanted to do was make me almost like a Lady Gaga for Africa. <laughs> 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 and. Uh, um, somehow deep within me, I, I, I felt and knew that was not the path that God was honoring to God. I don't think I would have been happy in that. And so, yeah, the conviction to just honor God and to trust him to provide is what led me to make that decision. Mm. Yeah. And you had been involved with, um, there was a Canadian family that was supporting you yeah. uh, through Compassion Canada. Yeah. And then you reached out to yeah, them? Yeah, it was such a fun experience. So... <laughs> Through compassion, um, the expectation is not that we will meet our sponsored families. But um, one of the things that we really do back there is we do appreciate the opportunity that's given to us. And uh, we'll pray for them every day. But I remember as a child, my prayer was always to meet my Canadian family. And so every time I would write to them, we have so many letters, I'll tell them, yeah, I, I'm praying that one day God will let me see you. So after a time in Compassion, after I was done, I did reach out to my now brother on, on, on Facebook. And uh, I reached out just to say thank you for all that um, you know, you've done for me, for pushing me. In fact, it's just to say thank you and move on with my life. But I had made a prayer, actually, I think after, because my, my mom died when I was around 14, 15. And I remember making a prayer and asking God and saying, God, you have allowed me to have a mother. I've experienced that, but I've actually never experienced a father's love. And mm -hmm. I want a father. Now, in my head, when I said that prayer, I was uh, hoping for um, a tall black man from somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> to come and uh, oh, that was that was my line of thought but uh, when I reached out to my brother on Facebook I didn't think he was going to reply because there were lots of um, other people with the same names and I think it was within five minutes 
and he replied, but he's like, oh, hi, Daisy. And so we got chatting, and then he um, uh, connected me to my sister, with whom I also chatted, and then she ended up giving me um, the home number. She's like, you should, you should call dad and say, and you, I, I think he would be happy to hear from you. And so, yeah, one day I pick up the phone call, and I'm like, oh, I'm just going to call it. So I called, and luckily enough, my dad picked up. And uh, we just started to talk, say, um, this is Daisy, and we just got along talking. And then I think it was um, almost a year later, yes, a year later, then he was able to come for a visit in Uganda. That's how we met, and just the Lord just connected us. I remember when we were talking that time, uh, it's just one of those things where it's just unexplainable. The only explanation I can give is God just brought us together and just, this was my father. And at first I was like, what? A white yeah. man? <laughs> Why? <laughs> and he's not real tall either. And he's not real tall either. So <laughs> what is going on? But it was such, it's been such um, an awesome experience. And through him, I have been able to really experience a father's love. And I, I call him my backbone and just push me. And so, yeah, it's been really awesome. And mm. through that, I got to meet um, a woman who's been really a mother to me in a lot of ways. And uh, my uncle Jim, <laughs> and mm. I <to> farm. <laughs> and yeah, so it's, it's really been awesome. Yeah, yeah great. Day. Don, I don't know if you wave, but people <laughs> wave so people know who you are. Yeah, he's the short white guy. <laughs> All right. Um, Daisy, what are, you, I mean, you're at Vanguard College now. What's God, what do you think God's calling you to do? Ministry. For sure. Um, and so it's, it's funny because I was talking to someone when you're going through the years and then you're always coming to an end with school, there's that big question, so where do I go? And um, I'm not yet 100% sure where he's leading me. The picture is not clear, but one thing I'm certain is that um, my life, the gifting is put in my life is really to honor him. And uh, whichever place, it's just kind of being in that place of uh, posture is like, okay, God, Wherever you choose to send me, I will go. So mm. that's Even back to Uganda? Even back to Uganda, if that's <laughs> what he chooses. <laughs> All right. Um, one of the highlights for me, I was working with uh, Breakforth, and um, I had gotten to know you a little bit, and I said to the Breakforth team, there's this girl who is like, can really sing well. Uh, we should have her sing at Breakforth. And probably one of the greatest moments at Breakforth, thousands of people, uh, was a time when there was a 100-voice choir, and Daisy sang the uh, lead on the song, Break These Chains. And it's a song that talks about how God will take you wherever you're at. Maybe you feel like there's things in your life, maybe sin that has set upon you. Maybe circumstances of life that you think there's just no way out. And he's listening, and he wants to set you free. And he wants to work in your life. He wants you to serve him. So for nostalgia... I'm going to ask, worship team, come on back up here. We're going to sing that song that we sang, What a Beautiful Name, and then we've got to sing at least a couple lines of Break These Chains, all right? So let's stand together, and we'll sing this in closing. Break 
if you'd close in prayer. I meet with uh, every Friday morning. There's some good heart to heart discussions and debates. And well, thank you, Brian. Just before I start the prayer, this is the most movement in the beginning of the service that I've seen Baptists do. <laughs> <laughs> I had to look around. I didn't know. Yeah. I was here. <laughs> Let's close in prayer, brothers and sisters. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for this time. As Pam. Just thank you for Daisy, and just thank you for all the people that were able to attend today. Beautiful weather, and just, just what a peaceful time to spend in worship of you. I ask that you just continue to, to work in our lives, to just show us your way, to help us conduct ourselves in a way that is honoring to you, and just uh, help this little church as they go about their, their plans and their finances, just to... Uh, Help them cover that and, and just uh, do it with discernment. And, and again, as, as Brian says, just keep it simple and just appreciate what you really have here. What a beautiful place. I ask all these things through our hope, our only hope, Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. There's food downstairs. Uh, you're welcome to. Let me just pray for that food. Heavenly Father, thank you for the food that's prepared and the hands that have prepared it. I pray you bless them. Bless our fellowship time together in Jesus' name. Amen.